And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer here to the temple, coming to creator of the Modern 5e project for mo for modern action and adventure because we because we don't need because fantasy we don't need no stinking fantasy the one and only Juxta games how you doing today man doing all right doing very good oh so a bit of a ha a bit of a habit of course is open with opening with the humble beginnings um, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick? Um, gosh, uh, we started playing uh, Easter weekend 1980 uh, with, uh, obviously at that time, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. um, we fell in love with it right away and we you know typical all weekend long kind of deal we'd play games uh and a buddy of mine um we started kind of playing with some mechanics and some of our own stuff because he and i both liked modern contemporary uh action rpgs too and it really wasn't much out at the time uh, if, if anything at all I, i'm trying to recall uh not much i think uh, game of world might have been out or just came out um but so so we just started playing with with ideas and uh, started writing up sort of homebrew rules um, to play out some modern adventures. And over the years, of course, I've delved into numerous numerous RPGs. Mm -hmm. um, I avidly uh, seek out uh, systems that I think have really interesting mechanics um i play with mechanics a lot i always have for the years so mm -hmm. uh that's kind of where i'm from and that's where i'll probably continue to go <laughs> yep. so when you when you given what given what you mentioned i'm get i'm guessing that when you're talking about more contemporary affairs you're think you're thinking more of um stuff stuff like sp um Stuff like spy fiction, stuff like um, mil stuff like military fiction or and military SF, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, we used to play a little bit of of uh, was a top secret, but um, we moved on pretty quickly to Victory Games years and years ago. Back in the eighties, came out with a James Bond role playing game, mm -hmm. and it, it was actually really ahead of its time. It was percentile based. Oh yeah, uh, skill. Skill based system, um, fairly light. It, it was kind of chart heavy, mm -hmm. but it played really well. We sort of fell in love with that, and we still play it to this day. So every now and then we'll break it out. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it, it, contemporary, uh, modern, um, science fiction. Uh, like example, we we play the new Alien RPG. We played. Uh, oh, yeah. it's, it's just a huge list. Of course, modern D twenty, of course. God help you if you played the old Alien RPG. <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, just the new one. It's the only one I've dove into. Yeah, there, there was, there was one about about fifteen years ago. Actually, not even fifteen years ago. It was, it was mid '90s when it came out. Um, I don't recommend it because um, it was using <laughs> it was using Phoenix Command's rule set, and that means chart hell. Ah, okay. Um, yeah. But when you, I, when you, since you had mentioned um, top secret, this is one of those things I I often have to ask. Were when you dipped into that system, was it the OG top secret or was it top secret SI? Um. Oh, good question. I'm trying to remember. I don't even have the box on the shelf or anymore or anything. I got an old module sitting around, mm -hmm. but I couldn't even tell you where it was. Um. I want to say it was, gosh, it was, I, I cannot remember, you know, it's been so long because we didn't, we didn't mess with it long. We, we passed it up pretty quick. So, 
Um, yeah, I can't even remember now. Yeah, if I had to get, if I had to guess, poss it was possibly, um, possibly top secret SI because that that was the one that was more widely available. It, um, and th that was the one that had a lot more stuff for it. So that that would be my guess, and probably mm -hmm. too, yeah. I mean, there was. Some so I, I live out. I live out. I live out in the middle of cornfield. So, aside from a, a nearby Walden bookstore or something, that's all we had access to that back then. No, oh, live living in a place surrounded by corn. Don't I know it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But everything's uh, everything's mail order out here. Yeah. But that brings that brings me to mo to uh, modern five E. Now the now. Was that, with given the um, mock-up co mock covers that you've that you've done as a proof of concept for the project, it I don't think it's unreasonable of me to to um, assume that th that what you're trying to do is essentially bring D20 Modern into Fifth Edition's rule set. Correct. Yeah. Um, um, and at its at its basic level only. Yeah. Um, so like the so like the character classes, and some of the some of the concepts and terms, the like advanced classes versus calling them archetypes or, or in five e, uh, of course e each character class has its own, you know, uh, archetype, but they do, they're just referred to as advanced classes in in modern d twenty. Yeah, and a few other things. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, um, that'd be fair. Um. Now, given th now, taking that into taking that into account, um, there's a few things from from um, 5e and a few things from D20 Modern that I'm curious if you how you'd plan on um, converting them. Um, I'll start I'll start with I'll start with something uh, start with something a little bit um, low key low key respectively. Um, D twenty modern. Well, it ha it ha it replaced the standard um, fantasy classes with six classes, each based around one of the six ability scores. But instead of do instead of doing a set of predetermined um, um, class features, it introduced the concept of talent trees, which was something that would later be perfected with Star Wars Saga Edition. Um. Are you when it comes to your take on the on the six uh, modern classes? Are you going to be using something similar, or is it going to be a more linear ser series of class features? Um, I'm going to first and foremost, the system is going to be five E mm -hmm. in it, in its approach and its in its methodologies. So, um, aside from some of the class concepts and and the features and the abilities um or talents in this case uh there won't be any any real trees they're going to be laid out just like 5e like like the standard 5e character classes but we are we are the plan is to use the six classes based around those abilities so mm -hmm. uh strong strong hero fast hero tough hero etc yeah yeah now when it comes to the now, one of the one of the other major things that was a um sig that was a significant departure from um from D and D three from D and D three um, e to D twenty modern was the concept of the wealth check. Um, is yes. that something you're you're planning on carrying over into this, or are you planning on using um more traditional currency? Yeah, currency. There's. In a modern setting, and this is the this is the reason why D twenty went this same direction. Modern currency is a nightmare. To you don't want you don't want your players to start keeping track of their characters' bank accounts, their investments, their uh, uh, you know their four hundred one k portfolios, and you just you don't want that. And then we're not even getting into cyber currency or anything yet. So yeah, we're going to retain the wealth check. Um, probably improve on it a little bit. Um, it's, I think it's going to be more based around the character's lifestyle, mm -hmm. which is a 5e. Uh, they, they don't go into lifestyles a lot in 5e. I think we're going to break that down a lot more. Mm -hmm. 
because your, your lifestyle will determine your wealth or vice versa. Your wealth may determine your, your, your lifestyle. And you will be able to, uh, for example, the characters will be able to take out a loan in order to make a higher wealth check than they would normally be able to. And then that would simply require the characters to make a regular wealth check to, you know, so many wealth checks to pay off that loan over a period of time. That's about as complicated as it's going to get. And that idea we actually got from uh, the original uh, Marvel RPG. Uh, Marvel uh, Face. Actually, yeah, yeah. They had a, uh, a loan system where the characters could just simply take out a loan and they could buy something bigger than what they normally could. And then they have to make so many rolls, uh, wealth, wealth check style rolls to pay it off. All right. Now, next it, now, 5e, 5e, of course, 5e, D&D, of course, still has the nine alignment, the, one, the, one of the oldest, me one of the oldest internet memes that there is. <laughs> um, All right. but modern, did did away with that and simply used a allegiance system. Now, granted, that allegiance system ultimately amounted to one more potential plus two when you're already going to be swimming in plus twos just just at the start. But it was a significant departure because that alignment system just isn't going to work in a modern setup. Are you going with allegiances, or are you going to try and work rework um, the alignment system to work to work with uh, modern five e? Um, we're going to use the alignment system. Um, one thing we, we we're touting um, very closely is we're maintaining 5e compatibility as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And when you walk away from the alignment system, you're walking away with a lot of compatibility. If, for example, you want to run a Shadowrun style modern sci-fi campaign that means you're going to be pulling in all the spells from this and the magic and stuff from the 5e rules and then suddenly you're going to run into issues if that alignment system isn't there because now you've got to start to reconfigure you know how a spell works or how a bit of magic works or something like that and we just don't want that i, w I want people to be able to open the player's handbook and pull a spell out directly and use it in the modern setting as it's written. In fact, that's the whole goal with the entire series is 100% compatibility with 5e mm -hmm. so that any fantasy book, even that uh, optional rule or you know, pull something from Tasha's, for example, the Tasha's handbook, mm -hmm. you're going to be able to do that. Um, of course, it, it needs to be appropriate for your campaign, and that's ultimately up to the GM. Yeah. But we want to maintain that 100% compatibility. Now, when it comes... Now, um, one, of the, uh, one of the interesting things that, um, mo that Modern did, even though, even though this isn't in um, 5e, is modifying the massive damage rule. Um, because in, in original 3.5, the massive damage rule was um, was 50 damage or more, and modern drastically reduced it. Um, I'm curious if, and granted, in 5e, ma the closest I've been able to find with massive damage is optional rules. Do you in, do you intend on keep on keeping on um, integrating massive damage back in, or is that something that? you decided wouldn't be compatible? Um, I think we're going to have an optional rule as well. Um, I think in its in its foundation, mm -hmm. we're going to have just exactly what 5e has. But I did want something in place. We're going to have a fair amount of optional rules. Uh, they're going to be located in the back of the book. Mm -hmm. um, one, of, one of them being... Uh, the damage or injury system is is what I like to call it. Um, another one is uh, mana for spells, as opposed to just uh, you know spell points by level, yeah, uh, that sort of thing. So there's going to be a fair amount of optional rules. Uh, mook rules also. So if you want to gun down, you know, twenty mooks all at once, there'll be rules for that. 
And, and there are similar rules in the back of the DMG, yeah. which uh, we may take advantage of too. Yeah. Um, of course, if I'm if I'm running something like this, and um, and I and and mooks are included, I'm probably going to have to include a rule that you that you might be able to roll with advantage if you can descri if you can justify pigeons showing up in a gunfight. <laughs> you know, just to get the just to get the John Woo reference out of there. But one of the uh, um. Since you mentioned that you mentioned that advanced classes are going to be integrated into the um, archetype setup, that brings me to that brings me to another thing. Um, now, obviously, doing the prerequisites that happened with advanced classes isn't going to be a thing, but um, subclasses in Five E are intrinsically tied to a given class most of the time, and advanced cl advanced classes in um, in D20 Modern weren't necessarily tied to that. Some of, some of them were, some of them weren't. It depended on prerequisites. How are you tackling that? Yeah, we're not going to have advanced classes tied to any specific base class. So you can crisscross all day long with advanced classes and whatever, whatever advanced class you're going to be. So you'll be able to have... Uh, just, just like in Modern D20, you'll be able to have a fast gunslinger or a strong gunslinger you'll be i mean gunslinger will just be a a generic they're, they're basically they're all going to be just a generic advanced class crisscross however you see fit or however the player wants mm -hmm. um when they, when they create their character so because of um the, each okay. go ahead well the the further thing i was going to ask on that is um in 5e some classes get some classes get access to their subclasses earlier than others um, is that are you going to have it that each of the base classes get that get access to advanced classes at the same rates or are some going to get it or some going to get it um, more quickly that's a good question I haven't looked at that particular detail um, as we as we get into each advanced class, we'll just have to take a look at it. Mm -hmm. um, where the idea was, you know, right around third level, uh, you would get to pick an advanced class just like you would uh, a subclass in Five E. Um, I know that varies a little bit, and yeah, we'll have to look at each because there's going to be a pretty fair amount of advanced classes starting off, um, including some real specialized ones. So. Yeah, we'll just have to take a look at that when, when we get into it. Each each Vance class will start off with uh, a saving throw uh, adjustment, uh, one skill list, and and then uh, each class will have its appropriate skills. Everything's going to be really well balanced because there, there's a certain number of skills, certain number of proficiencies, your tool slots, your languages. There are, there's almost a, not quite a set amount, but there almost is a real pattern to it in 5e. We're going to kind of follow that on through into modern 5e. All right. Now, D20 Modern was tr was trying to was trying to do was trying to do um, modern um, gaming, but in actual practice, it was it was more like uh, modern urban fantasy, like a lot of the a lot of the. Um, er, a lot of the urban fantasy shows that were gaining a lot of traction in the '90s and, two, and early 2000s is modern 5e in that particular vein, or are you trying, or are you trying to go as as um, as ground as grounded as you ca as you um, reasonably can? It's uh, the so the core rule book is going to be based strictly in contemporary modern times. Uh, the, ev the the standard Earth everyday world, so to speak, and then from that point, the, this will be the these these rules here will be the foundation for uh, what I'm referring to right now is expansion kits, which will be small booklets that they could get, which will expand the campaign into whatever direction the DM wants to take. You know, so if, if you want, for example, a Shadowrun style uh, modern 5e campaign, you would. You would use obviously the core rule book, and then there there would be a fantasy 
uh, book that would have all the fantasy elements in, mm -hmm. in which case you could pull in uh, the Fey races, uh, the uh, Half Ogre, and some of the other stuff. Um, and then you'd have magic and spells, obviously. And, of course, that would be somewhat of a sci-fi setting also. So you're going to have real modern weapons. And uh, there's actually a whole campaign that we're developing. Once we have the core rulebook done and a few expansion uh, supplements out, we're going to put a, a campaign book out called Sigil Fall. Mm -hmm. And that'll, that'll have a Shadowrun-style uh, campaign with a really nice beautifully written background to it it's i like shadow run and it's extremely well written but i've never really liked the idea of the awakening too much i thought it could always have been done a little better um and that's the direction we're going to go we're going to go with a really nice history uh about a hundred or so years into the future and there's the earth is sort of um in this state of of uh, recovery from what's called the Formorian Wars, mm -hmm. which took place. And it, it was the winter court from the Fae. The Fae winter court sort of sprung it on humanity and um, opened up the floodgates, so to speak, for the reawakening of magic and stuff like this. So there's a lot more detail and intricacy in the background and history of that. But mm -hmm. the core rules are, are basically pretty well grounded in just modern contemporary Earth. All right. Now, in in researching the idea the idea of a of a modern five E, I did look I did look at some um, similar projects. Um, some some of that, um, whether it be whether it be stuff like Gene Funk twenty ninety or um, or the spot or the spy game from um, Black Cats, and in some cases they with some of the with some of the classes. They made they made attempts to have um, spell slot equivalents, but instead of spells, it's gadgets. Um, are you doing so are you doing something akin to that with some, with some of the classes, or when it comes? And if not, how, if not, what would be the equivalent of the old FX abilities from um, D twenty Modern? Um. Gosh, the. That's a, that's a good question. Um, the FX abilities that, as I recall, and I'm, I'm flipping the book open real quick and take a peek at it, but as I recall, there were, yeah, the, I, and I've seen those too. I've seen those where, because uh, I backed some projects on Kickstarter mm -hmm. that uh, when they were published, you'd, you'd open them up, and for example, the medic would have... Um, spell almost spell like slots yeah and but they're 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 healing abilities you know that are sort of taken into account that he has the proper medicine and the tools available to him to basically create these effects and those are neat ideas i just don't know if i want to go into all of those charts and such um that's one of the things actually on the list that we're still kind of rummaging through exactly how we're going to, if we want to do that kind of approach. It, it's Right now it's not looking like it is. Mm -hmm. uh, the base classes are going to be, uh, just like they are in, in 5e, they're going to be a, a, a base class. It's really your advanced class that determines who the character is. Um, of course you can multi-class too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're just, we're just gonna have to wait and see on that. That's that's a good question. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it come, oh um, when it comes to when it comes to weapons and armor, um, obvious obviously there's obviously the approaches that can that can certainly work with, uh, medieval or antiquity era, um, kit doesn't can't really work when you, once you're dealing with once you're dealing with modern equipment um especially right. when you're dealing with d different types of firearms different types of bullet types and so and so on so there's a few questions i have on that first is obviously the um 
the the proficiency setup with um fi with from Five E Core um is is built for that sort of that sort of fantasy approach. Are you using the same relative um setup for for um weapon and armor proficiency, or is it going to be slightly different? It will be uh, broken down in the same way. Uh, obviously, the armor is going to be different. Of course, you could, I guess, always a character. I guess could always uh, buy antiquated armor, but uh, the armor is going to be broken up into light, medium, and heavy, just like they are in Five uh, E. And weapons will still be simple martial, uh, but we're also going to have. It looks like we're going to have heavy weapon, and then you can also specialize in a spin or or um, there's going to be. A few weapons that are sort of not thrown into a normal category, so special weapons, I guess. Um, well, and then there's and there, there's. Go ahead. What would count? What would count as a special weapon? I've got some. I've got some guesses, but I'm curious to pick your brain on that. Um. So a special weapon might be something, some unique piece of military equipment. So, for example, they've got those uh, those uh, extremely low decibel um, audio uh, projectors, uh, for the best, for lack of a better term, that sit on top of a Humvee. Um, if you look these up on the uh, on YouTube, you can find them. Uh, that would be a, that would be a unique vehicle. Uh, definitely a heavy, high tech weapon that. You know which category does it fit in? It kind of fits in its own category. It it releases really low decibels at a really long range. And the idea is it just uh, upsets the biology of the target, forcing them to puke <laughs> and uh, it feel extreme discomfort. Mm -hmm. um, so that that would be one possibility. Um, uh, there are others. I just don't have the list in front of me right now. Yeah, like when it, obvious when I think of obviously when I think of something like light weapons, I'm thinking I'm thinking um pist I'm thinking pistols um light rifles that that kind of thing with um with the ne with the next tiers um some, something like full, things like full auto things like shotguns the things you the things you would see in active deployment and heavy I'm thinking um. Mini guns, st stingers, RPGs, that that kind of thing. Which that does that does bring another another question that I'm curious about. Now, when it comes to weapon customization in Core Five E, all the the majority of the we weapon customization is largely relegated to um, magic items, <laughs> and obviously right. yep. that, obviously that's not going to fly in this kind of thing. So. Given how, when you look at a lot of you look at a lot of um, 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 modern style um, entries when it comes to video games and and other material, there is always there's always talk of um we of weapon customization or taking th taking things apart and c and doing custom work, even if it's just as simple as putting a putting a sight on or so or something. How is that going to um come across in modern Five E? Yeah, that's uh, so. The, the proficiencies um, are going to be expanded a little bit into uh, another, you know, other tool sets, more modern tool sets. Like, if, for example, if you have uh, proficiency in gunsmithing, you can use the gunsmithing tool, mm -hmm. and that allows you to modify uh, the weapons. Now, the weapons themselves are going to be. Um, not simply just thrown into categories. So you'll see a lot of mo modern uh, style RPGs where all of the pistols within this given range all fit into this one stat block that they call light pistol or something like that. We're not going to do that. Um, there will be a small section just for the GM to reference. Maybe we'll have those on the screen too. Of yeah, a light pistol because the mooks you don't need you know you don't need a lot of detail when you're dealing with mooks and things like this. Mm -hmm. But we plan on having actual specific weapons and weapon 
category. So if you want an Uzi nine millimeter, that will be able you'll be able to bring that into the game through a series of uh, translator charts. So they'll be in the back in the back of the uh, weapons section. Um, there's going to be rules for, and it, this probably won't be in the core book. It's, there's another expansion book we're coming out with called uh, uh, the Arsenal Archive. Mm -hmm. And in the back of that book is going to be all the rules for translating any uh, it's for translate. Excuse me here. My computer just freaked out on me. Uh, for translating any armor any modern armament and ammunition so there, there'll be a few charts that you're going to reference to and you'll be able to pull in any gun based on the, the ammo type and the and the traditional performance of the weapon and the weapon's weight the barrel length but once you once you look all this stuff up you'll be able to get you'll be able to create a stat block for that particular weapon and that's what we're going to do we're going to have massive amounts of weapon charts with all the popular weapons uh, of the last maybe 10 years, maybe even longer. All right. So, and, and with that, you'll be able to modify. So if your character wants to modify the barrel length of his shotgun in order to create that wider burst, um, he'll be able to do that with a gunsmithing kit. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of that, when it comes to skills... Are a lot of are you more or less using the same skill list as Core Five E, just with a bit of reskinning, or are there go or are there going to be some skills that are out and out new? There'll be a few new ones. Uh, we're also yeah reskinning some of the old ones, really kind of giving them not really changing their definition, but rather expanding upon their definition so that they fit in the in the modern times. Mm -hmm. uh, there are there will be a few new skills. Uh, we're still trying to figure out how to break that down as far as science technology you know do do we want just once you know we like for example in the fantasy setting you have uh, a skill just called arcana which covers a huge variety of 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 magic and magic related you know uh, research or whatever it is you might be doing i think we're going to go that follow that same route so i think we're going to have a side tech skill that's going to cover uh, modern technology and, and the use of, you know, your, a computer or, and then of course you, with that we get into tech levels too and it gets kind of nuts, but yeah, we're going to reskin a lot of the old skills and we're, we are going to have a few new ones. Yeah. Um, now obviously, obviously, sir, um, you look at, you look at, Fire, you look at um, firearms throughout history, and there's been plenty of instances of of some being a little bit let being a little bit less reliable than others, especially if they especially since one of the unwritten rules is your weapon was made by the lowest bidder. <laughs> um, so I'm cur I'm curious if I'm curious if you have an, if you have any plans for integrating rules for um mit for weapon mishaps, with the most simple example, of course, just being um, jamming. Yeah, uh, there, there'll be an optional rule where um, a weapon of lower quality, um, and this is something that is almost you have to use sort of sort of historical readings and reviews on stuff like that because ultimately you don't know the performance of any weapon until it's out there until it's been in the hands of experts for a while and then you can suddenly it comes out that the this particular this like colt for example there was a few years where colt although they invented the 911 there was a few years there where they were not really putting the performance uh you know the the, the tighter measurements in the production as the quality control mm -hmm. and there was a few years there there where the 911 just wasn't up to specs and that left room for a lot of uh, your copy company, you know, Springfield's 911 and, and et cetera, to come out and really fill that gap. So, yeah, uh, we were looking at the option of, for some weapons, if you roll a one or a one or two, 
um, that the weapon jams on you, and then you have to clear a jam, which will take an extra an extra action to do. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when it comes cheap and cheap cheap ammo can do the same thing too. So you can have, you know, if your character, you know, uh, has a gunsmithing skill and he's he's creating his own ammunition, if he doesn't make the roll right. You know that's that's a role that the GM might want to make himself in the background because if the, if the role isn't made correctly and if he rolls badly, he's created some bad ammo and that's going to come out you know later on in the game. Yeah, um, which is cer- is certainly apropos because I do I I do remember reading about how ta- about how um, for certain wars intentional dummy ammo was di- was um, distributed, um, and some of that is st- some of that is still in circulation. Oh really? Yeah, it's a funny tactic. Yeah. Yeah, basic basically to basically to try and it's when the when one of these dummy um dummy bullets tries to get fi- fired, it's probably going to destroy the rifle that fired it. Um, sure. Yeah. And as and as far as as far as um so as far as um substa- substandard equipment that can that can have issues, that tradition continues to this day because. Well, High Point exists, even though High Point is basically a meme at this point. Oh. I think I think we're gonna have I think we're gonna have a uh, uh, perhaps when the character purchases equipment, if he let's say the character's wealth is lower than what he wants to purchase, he could opt to purchase a lesser grade of equipment, and then. He'll he'll get the equipment that he wants, but there's always that chance of well, instead of a one, instead of jamming on a one, your particular weapon jams on a one or two because you spent a little less money purchasing. You bought some used stuff, for example. Mm-hmm. So that would be a nice option, I think, to have in there. Yeah. Speaking speaking of options, how do you plan on handling um recoil? Recoil, yeah. Every weapon's going to have a stat block. Um, for the most part, we're gonna we're not gonna we don't want to make the system too crunchy. The five E methodology sort of backs away from that crunchiness. Uh, you know, where you don't have to look up. Everything's going to be on your character sheet, and that's what that's what's going to make it flow nice. But every weapon's going to have a stat block, so there'll be a jam rating. It looks like there's going to be a recoil. Of course, that's gonna that's gonna really only affect weapons on full auto. That's that's where the recoil is really gonna come into play. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if there's gonna be, you know, uh, there's there's so all the weapons are gonna have uh, weapon properties just like they do in the fantasy. So you have, um, you know, thrown weapon properties is a good example. Um, you have your light weapon property, etc. The modern weapons will do the same thing, and I think there's going to be a recoil property to certain weapons when they are activated on full auto, mm-hmm. and I think that's going to make it. Um, it, it might grant a slight minus. Um, not sure about the mechanic on that, but there is going to be some recoil feature in there, yeah, for some weapons. Oh. All right, I I can uh, I can get I can get I can get behind I can get behind that. Um, when it now, one of the one of the major and one of the major entries that D twenty Modern had was the it was um the introduction of action points, which. If I'm not mistaken, it may have it may have been in a um th- in a three e splat in a three e splat book. I don't I don't feel like going through my library of three e of three e sl- splat books to check, but I think it came out in D in D twenty modern first. Um, do you plan on inter- on on integrating action points in in some manner, or d- or is that not in the cards? We're gonna have. Uh, in in the core system, we're going to have inspiration, just as it is in Five E. However, there are there is going to be what we're calling a we're calling them right now uh, hero points, mm-hmm. and hero point will work. It's more mechanical, um, less 
guesswork or less um mm, it, it's not you know like inspiration it's pretty much left up to the judgment of the gm as to whether yeah. uh you get a point or not whereas this is going to be an optional system that he can use to i suppose he could run inspiration and hero but i don't i don't think so uh, unless you wanted to run inspiration just for the role playing aspect alone, but hero points are going to be more mechanical. So every time, for example, the the working system we have right now is when you roll a d20 and you roll a natural 20, you get a hero point because you have um, learned something um, in the process of. Now you have to be under initiative, obviously. So this can't be using skills out of combat this is under this is in a stressful situation when you're under initiative and in combat you can use a hero point that's why they're called hero points so you, you really need to be under initiative to use them so you're going to roll a natural 20 you're going to get a hero point you're going to roll a one and you're going to get a hero point now your weapon may jam but you're going to get a hero point uh hero points cannot be used immediately they can only be used in the following uh, consecutive rounds and you can build them up and they will um, whereas inspiration grants you advantage on a roll and some other stuff these are just going to literally grant you like a plus one so you could spend three hero points and you could get a plus three to your roll or something like that All and right. you can use them you can you can also grant them to your fellow players as well so if somebody else is in a pinch you could say i'm going to grant two hero points to my partner in combat. And that, that sort of simulates the characters working together in combat, um, getting to know each other and how they function, how, how each person functions in combat and their familiarity with each other. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of, speaking of combat, there's one other avenue with combat that I... Th that given it given its presence in cer in certain movies over the years is kind of inevitable to discuss and that is vehicular combat um yep modern had its own, had its own set of chase rules which was all right for the time if a little bit um, primitive um how are you how would you be ha how would you handle vehicle combat for modern 5e we're actually t we're actually stealing a little bit of uh, of mechanic from that old Victory Games Bond James Bond game that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. They had a really nice chase system, and we're actually going to sort of port that over to Five E. Um, so what that involves is the the lead vehicle, the one is presumably the one that's actually being chased, the chase E, in other words. Is, is sort of in control of the chase because everybody else is just trying to catch that person. So there isn't really much in the way of initiative. Or if we do have initiative, the lead vehicle would, would probably gain advantage on that about every round. Now, there are range categories between you and the chasers, and there are also obstacles that typically show up in sort of classic ways, uh, you know, the woman with a baby stroller <laughs> that wanders out in the middle of the road, that, that sort of thing. Mm. So there's going to be these, there's going to, there's going to be various charts and obstacles based upon the, the terrain and the population density of where the chase is happening. And you, you'll be able to, and, and that, and those charts are going to be simulating a very integral part of the chase, almost like another player. And, so that uh, that other player, that invisible player that the, the GM's kind of controlling and kind of not controlling, uh, you'll roll on these charts, and that's going to introduce uh, obstacles. And, and these obstacles could could be anything. And it could, uh, the chase system could also uh, incorporate if you're being if you're using a you know if you're running on foot, if you're on motorcycle, if you're in a boat, you're in a plane, you're in a car. So it'll be a, a nice multi-genre so to speak or multi-functional chase chase rules and the idea is your combatants need to close the gap and there's going to be maneuvers and some vehicles are going to be better at certain maneuvers than others mm -hmm. and there'll be a list of maneuvers that you can do so if you want to do a turn back which is a, a, a spin spin the car completely and head back the other direction um, some cars are, are better at it than others mm -hmm. um 
uh, the older vehicles are actually better than that, than the newer ones because the newer ones have uh, anti-lock brakes, which really still sort of screws everything up. Um, so there's also going to be uh, you can interject combat. Obviously, in this there's there's gunplay that can be that can be thrown in. Uh, this is where the vehicle stat blocks really come into play, though. So every vehicle's going to have a typical stat blocks, and you can look these up. They, they look just like monster stat blocks. They're just like they're written up just like monsters. Vehicles are. So they all have strength, dexterity, constitution. All all vehicles have this, and then they have a list of actions they can perform, just like a monster. And those actions are basically the types of maneuvers and things like this. Now, if it's a tank. Or, or a APC or an armored car or something like that, it might have combat actions it can perform as well if it's got big guns and that sort of thing. And of course, you got armor that can, uh, armor plating that can come in and affect the armor class. And then you're also going to have a red line ability. And that, that's what's taken from the, from the James Bond games. Um, a red line is uh, you, the, the, as an opera, as a, as an operator of the vehicle, you can choose how you how hard you want to push the vehicle and when you when you pass its red line um bad things can happen and that's where if you pass the red line and you happen to roll low that's like jamming on a gun something's going to happen something's going to break down you just threw an oil pan or a gasket or you know a valve out the hood or blew a tire or you know what have you mm -hmm. um that that red line is going to be based upon the constitution of the vehicle or the constitution of the person who's on foot. Again, the chase, this chase rules will work uh, kind of any, any situation. So based upon the constitution, if you, if you push the vehicle past that, past a certain point, bad things could happen. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, a, that kind of is part of the old classic chase rules as, as well. So. All right. Um, now, when it comes to when it comes now when it comes to feats, um, would I'm guessing I'm guessing that the majority of feats that are in that are in core are gonna be are gonna be ported over. Are there go, are there going to be some avenues that are going to require new feats, or do you see um the do you see um the vast majority being um ports or reskins? Uh, a little bit of both. We've got quite a few new ones on the list. Um, there's going to be some obvious ones like uh, the alert uh, feat in 5e. Um, that's not part of the SRD. So technically, we couldn't use the alert feat as worded. But we can reword it to aware, and we can apply our own definition to it. Mm -hmm. So... Because the, the SRD only has one feat, uh, and that's it. So everything else we have to either reskin ourselves, rename it, reskin it, or come up with new ones. But we have a pretty good list of new ones. So we've got, uh, you know, some examples would be heavy heavy weapons expert, um, linguistics, um, a parkour expert. Uh, rifle expert, pistol expert, and those are based on, like the pistol expert, for example, is basically the crossbow expert, just ported over into modern times, that sort of thing. Uh, we have streetwise feats, we have uh, tough feats, we have wealthy, we also have a feat called wealthy, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do with that yet, but I thought if the character wanted to be particularly good or very wealthy, if they wanted to spend a slot, a feet slot, which is kind of a big deal in 5e, you could really be very good in investments and, you know, your character's fairly wealthy or is good at handling their wealth. Mm -hmm. um, armor expert, uh, guardian would be one, but that's, that's basically the same as the sentinel uh, in 5e. Marksman would be the port of sharpshooter. Um... We're going to have a healer feat of some kind. Uh, lethal would be a port of savage attacker uh, for melee or ranged both. So, yeah, we're looking at, at quite a few, a fair amount of new feats, but a lot of porting because if we want to bring in similar feats from 5e, we just we have to rename them and, and re, re, uh, redefine them mm -hmm. 
-hmm. so that we don't tra trample on their intellectual property. Yeah. Now, when you given the given the given the inclusion of parkour as a feed, that does that does beg the question for me at least. Um, when it comes to the chase rules, is it strictly vehicular chases, or is it is it portable over to a good old fashioned on foot chase? Yeah, just like uh, as I mentioned before, you can you can use the chase rules in any situation. So they're good in vehicles. They'll work on foot. They'll work in uh, uh, bicycles, uh, go karts. Uh, they're going to work in in a slightly modified version, but the the basic core will also work for uh, you know air air to air combat dog fights. Um, so it's going to be a pretty neat, pretty flexible system. Now, in a lot of um, in a lot of modern action style games, there's there's kind of a built there's kind of a built-in assumption that the player characters are members of some sort of clandestine some sort of clandestine organization or some or some um, branch that ha that handles these that handles these kind of things. Um, Ghost Ops it, Ghost Ops's ICO is a um, ex is a prime example of this kind of thing. Um, yep. Now within the now, uh, um, now I'm not bringing this up t to ask if you've got an equivalent, but more, uh, but more of how you'd handle downtime with with um ca with characters in this organization. Are there going to be some? Or, or do you plan on having some degree of down of um downtime rules between, for lack of a better term, missions? Yeah, downtime rules. We're going to get pretty heavy into downtime rules uh, because that's where you would, if your character wanted to do modify the equipment or, uh, you know, use your your gun uh, smithing tools or use your vehicle tools to make modify your vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to have to have downtime rules for that. But uh, it, you know, there's a lot to me. There's a lot more importance on downtime in a modern setting than there is in a fantasy setting. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, the second part, so yeah, we're going to have a lot of downtime stuff, but the second part of that is in regards to the organizations. We are going to have factions. We are going to have uh, patrons. A patron being an individual who's helping the group out. I think that's, that's it'll be a modified version of the... Uh, Actually, a more detailed version of what's in the Tasha's handbook. Hmm. Um, they they briefly go into patrons there, but factions are going to have faction blocks. So factions are actually going to have stat blocks, and those stat blocks are going to be just like monsters again. So uh, a corporation can have a strength, a constitution, uh, a dexterity, and intelligence, and, the, and these these sort of mimic the modern ideas of what a corporation can do so it, its strength might be its military strength its uh dexterity might be its mobility its ability to uh handle its logistics very well its intelligence might be literally that its intelligence capabilities its charisma might be its marketing capability so that's what the abilities are going to represent and then corporations are going to have their own wealth their own wealth bonuses and things that will translate down into the characters who are a part of that faction as well. Mm -hmm. And then corporations can perform. Some corporations are better at doing things than others, so there's going to be specific actions um, listed in the stat block, just like a monster. And you could actually technically have faction wars. So you could have one criminal organization on one side of town going against another, and they're trying to... Uh, a good example would be they're trying to... Um, uh, not necessarily outright attack them, but uh, create a situation where the enemy organization um, is sort of their name is being trashed on the streets. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a uh, ability where they could use their charisma, make it a check to see if they could uh, trash talk them on the street and lower their reputation, kind of. So there'll be that sort of um, interaction between factions you could do as a GM. And if a player wanted to create, eventually if a player became powerful enough, he could maybe create his own faction or become a patron himself. So, mm -hmm. 
Now, since you mentioned Shadowrun, it's it, one of the co one of the core things in that. In fact, it's in fact it's something that has to be taken into account in character creation. Is the fact that no man is an island, and a lot of times getting stuff done is is just as much about just as much about who and, and who you know and who knows you as it is what you can do. Right. So yep. how is how do you plan on reflecting that within um modern 5e? Well in a, in, a, in sort of a classic Shadowrun situation um they usually had a fixer or something like that that would mm -hmm. give the um hand out the missions and sort of set a uh, direction Mr. for Johnson. your party. Yeah, Johnson, yeah, yeah. Um, similar situation, if, if the GM wanted to approach that, he could use the patrons or the faction that they happen to belong to. It depends on, it ultimately depends on the style of the game that the GM and the players are running. So if, they were, if they're running a military-style game, for example, where they're all special ops uh, characters taking, you know, hunting down uh, terror cells, uh, that's a pretty straightforward, you know, mechanic uh or not really mechanic but a straightforward situation where the gm can simply dish out these these orders to these for these missions you could also have a a, a group of characters that belong to an agency or a faction again the cia which is would basically be a faction uh, in fact we're going to staff the cia up and all the all the big agencies so i'll have a patron maybe for example that typically dishes out their orders in a much similar way to Shadowrun style gaming um but the character, you could also just run sandbox if the characters, maybe they're all part of a private investigation agency, or they all go, they all went in together to form a, maybe they're a mercenary, you know, a group of mercenaries. Um, you know, the, the the gates are really, once we get the core rule book open, the the floodgates can really, can really come open, and uh, you can go a lot of different directions with this. Mm -hmm. Now. Take now, um, taking that into taking all that into account, um, what what would you ultimately be shooting for as far as a total um, page count? Yeah, originally we were going to go with about a three hundred page hardback uh, book that was going to have it was going to have a lot of stuff in it, and we're sort of leaning away from that at this point thinking that i think we're just going to have uh, a booklet form it's about 150 pages plus and it's going to have just what you need to play the game and then the expansion kits will take it from there because there's so many things that a gm might want or might not want in the book and oftentimes, when you, when you get into these situations where you have these really thick, modern uh, games that are multi-genre, that are designed to do anything with, which is what we're aiming to, you know, it's what we're going with also. But when you have these really big, thick ones, and you hand that to the players, you know, the players want to see all this other stuff that the GM really isn't using in the game. And it kind of becomes a headache because the players are flipping through it going, oh, I want this, or are we going to go this direction or that direction? Where in this case, you know, you can hand the, the cores book to the players and say, just create your characters from this and this particular handbook and this particular expansion kit and then leave it at that. He doesn't have to deal with all of the other stuff. Uh, for example, if you're not doing a shadow run style or high tech, then... You know, you're not having to present that stuff to your players and have them flip through the book past it to try to find their own, to, to try to find their specific stuff for your campaign. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be a, a better system if we break it down in that way. I I can certainly I can certainly see that and get and certainly get behind that. And given given all of that, I definitely will be looking forward to seeing how this how this kind of thing develops and figuring out what sort of build I can make that would be that would be just as infuriating to my G, to my GM as the Palaver build <laughs> is for um, 5e. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah. And it's, uh, every game has their advantages, disadvantages. No pun intended. Mm -hmm. But yeah, every you know, there's we're going to try to limit you know the type of stuff that we think might break the game. Uh, but players are the most in, 
genius of individuals. Uh, I've got one in my group, and he is notorious for spending hours looking through all of the options. Um, quite a bit have been maxing sometimes, but we sort of expect that out of him now, so it's kind of funny to wait and see what he comes up with. But he is he is one of the best I've seen at, at finding the flaws. And so I'm really looking forward to maybe getting his opinion on stuff and having him go through it and you know, really point out that, oh, here, look at this. I could, you know, I can get this giant bonus here if I combine these two, you know, things. So, yeah, it, every system is going to have, every system has its flaws and it's and it's a matter of finding them and, and try to come up with a nice balanced system. But you, inevitably, there's going to be something in there that players are going to find and latch a hold of. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the infamous legend of Pun Pun. <laughs> Pun pun. I've heard the reference. I don't know the exact uh, definition pun or the, pun the exact was, reference. Pun pun was one of those things in the three days on on the old wizards forums to try and make the most broken ass build possible. <laughs> and the result <laughs> was a, the result was a kobold who, because of a couple loopholes, could theoretically take infinite levels and in infinite classes. Wow, okay, that's a big one. I am vastly <laughs> simplifying the matter, but the, po the point is, it was one of those beautiful and terrible things that everybody looked at and said, let's not do this in our, at our tables, ever. Right. Yeah, ultimately, it, it, it takes, you know, the cooperation of, of the group to say where they're, where they're drawing the line in the sand at. Uh, I mean, the GM can do it easily, but if he gets the cooperation of his players... Uh, that's a really big help. Mm -hmm. So, a good, a good group will know where their boundaries are. Yeah. But there's, like I said, there's always something. I, I saw an article on uh, on the uh, ability. Somebody put a bill together where they they had thousands could 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 control thousands of undead. Um, it, you just need to get the right abilities under the right classes and. It became a real nightmare. For, if somebody for, is not yeah. using that build to reenact the dancing scene from Thriller, I will be very disappointed in my fel in my fellow <laughs> shit lords. Yeah, well, well, that's what I would do with it. <laughs> right? I'd either I'd either be doing that, or I'd be or I'd be reenacting the Q and Pete C um, conga line from The Mask. Because oh I'm, yeah. <laughs> My mind, my mind very much turns to making builds for the sole purpose of doing dumb things. Yeah, uh, if if you, yeah, I can see uh, a lot of um, possibilities with with that being a very interruptive to a game. <laughs> Especially, if, especially if, if you're the player sitting on the other side of the table and you got a laptop in front of you, got your character on it, and then suddenly you start playing the Michael Jackson music, you know that <laughs> would just really that'd be hilarious. Um, on one on one hand, I, on one hand, I can make that player sing terribly and make everybody else suffer, so it all evens out. <laughs> sure, yeah. You know, if he's a bard, you got to, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, what what else is what else is the bard gonna do? Die. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, but a bard probably wouldn't have all the abilities that we were talking about a second ago. So mm -hmm. I don't think, uh, uh, a wizard in a robe, I, I don't think seeing Gandalf do the dance would quite have the same effect. Yeah. But, but it would be humorous. Mm -hmm. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come all the way come all the way to the temple and enjoy the insanity at play here. Oh, I appreciate you having me. It's, it's been fun. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's for further developments with modern five E or just to, just to let, just to laugh at, pe at people playing gimp dash ranger builds. Um, the door is always open. <laughs> as okay. I often, appreciate as, it. Mm -hmm, as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll keep you informed on how things progress, so yep. I appreciate it. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then...
On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!